good morning. We welcome Facebook Live, and we welcome all of you to worship together with us this morning. We'll start with the Word of God. If you'd stand with me here in the worship center, and let's rejoice in Jesus. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of of sins. And we have redemption through his blood and we rejoice in that through the death of Christ that he paid that price that we deserve to pay so that we could have life because of his death. Let's praise him. I'll lead out then you follow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. The other towns I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. The other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood, nothing but the Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. The other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. The other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but that cleansing blood. For the blood of Jesus that washes away our sin. You may be seated. And this morning we celebrate as we enter the week of Easter that this is the week we celebrate that Christ came to shed his blood for you and for me and for our sins. And just as that Passover angel passed over Egypt, it was the blood of a lamb that protected those in the household from death. And it is only the blood of Christ that protects us from death. And death no longer do we fear because Christ has shed his blood for us. And death for us is victory because then we enter into the presence of an eternal God and we enjoy him forever and ever. That's what we're here to worship and celebrate today. Our Savior Jesus who has come to give us life and to give us life eternal. And I know... We're living in a nation right now that is in the fear of the shadow of death. 
But church, you and I should not be living in the fear of the shadow of death, but we should be celebrating the death of our Savior and His resurrection. And it's now at Easter that we really celebrate it, and we should be bolder than we've been in the past couple weeks and months, declaring that we're not afraid because we know who's in control, and we know that death is just a doorway for us into His presence. And we should invite others to experience that as well. Perhaps you want to get on the altar this morning and pray, interceding for some around you that you've been trying to witness to and share with them the hope of heaven. Perhaps you just want to pray for our leaders and our nation uh, as we go through this experience that people would wake up and realize that there's hope in Jesus and they need to turn to him. But I invite you, whether you're watching on Facebook Live, to offer up your prayers to the Lord at this time or here in the sanctuary. Let's go before the Lord this morning and let's realize that there is victory in the blood of Christ and for all those who are under his blood. Pray with me this morning, if you will. Father in heaven, we stop today and celebrate that, God, you are a God who is near and not far, that you have given us victory through the blood of your Son, that, Father, through his death, in his death, he defeated death. And in his death, we have life. For all who repent and place their faith and trust in Christ. And Father, this week we, we celebrate that there was a king who came triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem with one purpose and one mission. His face set like a flint to go to a cross to die for us. And Father, may we this week truly Reflect on how wretched sinners we were, how undeserving we were, but how great your love is that you showed us by sending Christ to die for us. God, may we live as those who've been set free from the fear of death. We love you today. We gather to worship you, to magnify your name, to declare there is no God like our God. And we are here to lift you up and praise you. So may our worship be pleasing to you here in the sanctuary or wherever we may find ourselves. All those who are under the sound of my voice today, may their worship be of you, the God who is the resurrection and the life and who has conquered death. We love you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said amen and amen. And amen. Again, this morning, welcome to worship here at South River Baptist Church and to those who are watching online or listening on the radio. We're so thankful for you today to be joining with us in worship, and we're here to worship a great and mighty God. Now, we love to say hey, because our God is a hospitable God, and he is a winsome God and wants to draw us to his presence, and we want the, we believe as the people of God, we should have that same presence within our hearts. And so, let me give you a chance this morning to uh, give your neighbors a thumbs up and tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord, uh, to greet those who may be visiting with us today. And uh, here at South River or online, we say good morning to you. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, we'll maintain our social distancing as is recommended. But if you want to uh, go and say, hey, to your brother and sister, let's do that at this time. But let's say welcome into the house of the Lord this morning to those around us. You gather and greet one another this morning. Well, let's gather back together this morning 
as we're reminded of what Jesus has done for us. We know that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And because, in order for us to have life in Christ, we had to die to ourselves. Just like that picture of baptism. You remember that day when that happened in your life? I hope that you do and you realize that you were begotten again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we are identified with his death. So let, let's celebrate the hope that he gives us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How great the chasm that lay between
our living hope. Did you hear the words in that chorus? Death has lost its grip on me. Yes, it was true that death had its grip on us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but he has quickened us. He has made us alive because he is the living hope. He is the one we hope in. We have no hope in and of ourselves, but only in Christ and in Christ alone, the sacrifice that he gave for us. He went to that tree. He took on that agony that we deserve because we deserve death for our own sins. But he took that on for us, and he was the perfect sacrifice. Well, we know all of that because of the word of God. And Jesus said this, man shall not live by bread alone. A lot of people living by bread alone today, right? Seeing what I can get because I got I got to stay alive. I got to I got to I got to protect myself and my family and God does give us that understanding for protection. However, we know that our ultimate protection is not in ourselves and what we provide for ourselves, but what he provides for us. And he is the one who gives at all from his good and gracious hand. So it says, man should not live by bread alone, but, say it with me, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so when we look to the word, we should cherish every single word of it, everything that he says. When we open God's word, he speaks to us. And so we cherish that word, that truth, that encouragement that we need every single day. So as we open his word, we are just reminded to open our hearts to him every time we open it up together. Let's read his word together and rejoice in the victory that we have over death. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory through what he did on the cross for us. We know that his mercy reigns in our lives because of the beautiful cross that he died on. Beautiful to us now because it has given us life through his death. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where
yes, we thank you. Thank you that we do owe all to you because, Jesus, you paid that price for us, that we might have life. You went to the cross and died a horrible death and took on our sin so that we would have life out of the midst of death, out of that victory over death. We have life. Lord, we celebrate that today. And Lord, what you ask of us is that we lay down our lives for you. We die to ourselves. And then you resurrect us with life. We know that from your word. And your word tells us that, that we surrender our lives. We give our lives to you. And that when we die, we die in Christ. And then we're raised again to walk in newness of life. Thank you. For that life. And now, Lord, as we give our lives, may we give our offering today. May you be pleased with our offering that we give back to you for your glory, for your praise. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, remember on Facebook Live that you are able to give as well. And we, we ask that you do that during this time while we give our offering right here in this place of worship. You can go right there on our website, southriverbaptist.com, and, uh, and you can give there as well. The ministry of God goes on right here in this place and right here in this community as, uh, as we extend His grace through South River Baptist Church. will fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Darlene. Praise God, my life and your life is firmly fixed in His hands. Amen. And He holds us in the palm of His hands. No one can pluck us out of His hands. We're sealed by the Spirit of God, safe and secure in His hands. The children are heading off to enjoy children's church and study God's Word. And I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word this morning, returning to the book of Hebrews. Today is the day we call Palm Sunday. It's a day that we celebrate, we remember. Jesus entered into Jerusalem uh, as the Savior and as the King, riding low on a donkey into Jerusalem. That large crowd that gathered there to wave their palm branches and to put their cloaks across the road to keep the dust and dirt down. Hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people, shouting and celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And God's word tells us that they cut those palm branches and they waved them in the air and they laid them on the ground as he came into the city. And this was the one that they were celebrating. Finally, victory, finally, a conqueror, finally someone who will liberate us and set us free. And when they shouted Hosanna, they were hailing him as the king. That word literally means save us. Save us. Deliver us. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to be free. And they thought that he was coming to liberate them, to set them free. And he was, but not in the way they thought. And so many today want to be set free. Free from their homes, right? <laughs> In bondage, in prison, there in your cell. You can't leave your quarters. You can't leave your property without papers. You can't live and freely converse with your neighbors or play with the kids on the playground. We must maintain this distancing, being conditioned, I fear, by I don't know whatever authorities are out there. The crowds that day didn't understand the victory Jesus was bringing them. They didn't understand uh, that he was there to deliver them from oppression and from bondage. They wanted to be free from the oppressor, the oppression of the Roman Empire. Those invaders, everywhere you turned, you saw their presence. Soldiers who would make you carry their gear one mile. The tax collectors present everywhere, collecting, collecting those taxes to give to Caesar. God's people wanted to be delivered, and they thought Jesus finally was going to bring them the deliverance that they hoped for. And He was coming to deliver them, but to deliver them from a small, unseen enemy whose effects were evident everywhere in homes, in relationships, in the rule of tyrants and leaders, even in businesses. Jesus was coming to defeat sin and deliver them from the bondage of sin and from the bondage of the fear of death. But they didn't understand that. And today, I think the church in some ways is saying, save us, save us. And they don't realize that God has already saved us. He's already given us victory. And we're living in defeat. Now, I've been wrestling with this 
all week. I've been wrestling with this for several months, to be honest with you, since all this stuff has happened. Because some things just don't make sense. And I may say some things today that make you say amen, and I may say some things that make you say oh my. But what I'm going to try to do is show you from the Word of God why the church should be shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise the Lord, save us, <clears throat> because we've been saved. And save us from the tyranny that's taking place and being swept across not only our land, but this world. You see, the church is blind in some ways to what Christ has done for us and delivered us from. At least we're living like that. I fear the church is not living victorious today over the fear of the shadow of death. Some believe the church is running scared from the rider of the pale horse. A small virus causing death? Yes, sadly. A small virus bringing catastrophic death? Well, it did in one region. But where are the statistics doing that? All over the world. That's what we've been warned. In fact, I hold in my hands the uh, printout from the CDC. This is not manufactured facts. This is their facts. How many diseases cause death per day worldwide? Right now, the coronavirus daily, worldwide, it says, produces about 56 deaths per day. Now, these statistics were taken a couple weeks ago. But every day, 3,000 people die from tuberculosis, tuberculosis every day. 2,000 die every day from AIDS. 2,000 die every day from pneumonia. 1,200 die every day from the rotavirus. You go down this list and you see the thousands that die every single day. And when you see the coronavirus, the fear that they are causing, it doesn't even measure up to other diseases that are wreaking more havoc. Never mind the abortionists who are killing thousands every day. Now, if we really want to save life, and if we're really serious that we're in the shadow of death, then either the statistics are wrong or what they're telling us is wrong, or someone's trying to hoodwink the people of this world. I'll let you decide for yourself. COVID-19 does kill. Less than 2% of the people infected by it. And yes, it's been unleashed on this earth, and it's sad what is happening. No one likes to see death. I don't like to see death. I don't like ministering to those who've lost a loved one. It's never fun. I don't like standing at the graveside. But I do know this, that for the believer in Jesus Christ, when we stand at the graveside, when we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not fear. We should not fear. Why? Because we have an everlasting hope because of what Christ has done. You see, some say we're living in the last days. Some say they're, they're believing the eschaton is about to happen and, and Christ is going to return soon. Well, you see, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it's going to say that if you believe the day is approaching, that you don't forsake the assembling of the brethren together, as is the manner of some, but you exhort one another even much more as you see that day approaching. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. You see, many think the proper response to the plague or pestilence or whatever this thing is, is closing the door. But according to Hebrews, if we believe this is the end, then Christians should be assembling together, praying together, encouraging one another, and going into the face of death and ministering to those who have no hope. And yet that's not what's happening. In fact, as churches have closed the doors, we've been informed this week that they've also, some of them have closed their ministries to hungry kids in our community. So we're picking up that and finding ways to minister to those who just need basic sustenance on the weekend. They were already starving. That's why the government's been feeding them. 
And we were giving them supplemental bags on the weekend. And churches were doing that. But they closed their doors and the principals told us they stopped doing that too. Well, I thought we were here to help life. And minister to those who are in need. What happens when the church closes its doors? What we're doing is allowing the government to take our place. Now here's the scary thing that just bothers me as a pastor and I've wrestled with this week. You're just getting it real and raw today, even on Facebook Live. This is Easter. A time when we celebrate two things. Death and life. You say we celebrate death. We've been singing about it this morning. We've been singing and celebrating that there's one who died for us. And because he died for us, he gives us victory over death. And next week, we'll be celebrating the one who was raised from the dead as the evidence and proof that he has power over death. This is a time that we're supposed to reflect on Christ's death on the cross. We're a time where we realize he died for our rebellion, our disobedience. He died in our place. But it's also a time that we celebrate that that blood that washes us and makes us white as snow and enables us to stand in the presence of God, not fearing his wrath any longer. That one who has delivered us gives us victory, not just in eternal life, but he gives us victory now to live not fearing death. But is that what we see? Are we living like that as believers? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to stomp on your toes this morning, but I am trying to wake you up and help you to realize if our faith is real, if he holds us in his grasp, if he's written all of our days in a book, beloved, you're going to live every single one of them, every single one of them that he intended. Not one more and not one less. No virus is going to take you out unless God says, take him out. That's the way it is. But are we living like that or are we cowering in fear? Well, you just got to stay your distance, Pastor Scott. I don't want you breathing on me, sneezing on me. My goodness, what have we done for thousands and thousands of years? Maintain our social distance at times. Yes, you take precautions. That is absolutely wise as necessary. You wash your hands. Amen. Mama taught us that. But beloved, in some ways, this is going over the top. Unnecessarily. Wow, these are bold statements, Pastor Chris. Well, let me show you from the Word of God why I'm motivated to live this way. And why I'm not living, living in the fear of the shadow of of death. Take your Bible and open to Hebrews chapter 2. Now you see, in this chapter, Paul is celebrating that the infinite, almighty God, who is fully God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ the final word. It was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In other words, he's the creator of everything in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. How did he do that? Well, he came and took on flesh. Inasmuch, verse 14 then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And today we need his aid. And so, Father, our hearts are open. Our eyes are open. God, speak to us from your word. God, help our unbelief today. 
God, give us aid, give us succor, give us your, your, your blessing, your divine healing today. So that, Father, we will live victorious even in the face of death. Because we know the one who has conquered death and the grave. And Lord, today may we celebrate that and live like that as the children, the seed of Abraham, the children of God. And we love you and we praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The devil does not want you to listen carefully. He'd love for you to shut your Bibles right now and shut your hearts and your ears to what I'm going to say about what Christ has done for us. Don't let him win. Don't let him have victory in your life. Don't forget what Christ has done for you and for me. Jesus took on flesh to bring many sons, it says there in verse 10, to bring many sons and daughters, many of mankind, to glory. His desire when he came to this earth was to defeat the devil and to bring us to victory. He took on flesh and blood and identified with mankind to redeem us. He wasn't content to be crowned with glory alone. He desired to share that glory with us and to bring many sons to glory. And in order to accomplish that, so that you and I could take on the divine nature, not that we could become God's, sorry Mormons, that's not accurate, so that we could take on the divine, be partakers of the divine nature, as Peter would say, and be able to live forever with glorified bodies, he had to take on one of these bodies. He came and took on flesh, fully God, fully man, the hypostatic union, all in one person, fully God and fully man. He identified with us, and he suffered just as we suffered, and he was tempted just as we are tempted, but he never sinned. He did that for you and for me, and he came because he wanted to deliver us from the devil, from the sin, and from death that had polluted this world. Now, in these final verses, Paul is writing, and he's saying to you, and he's saying to me, man, realize who Jesus is today, and celebrate it. And celebrate what he's done for you. He is the conqueror who has defeated our enemy. You see, there's a great cosmic battle that's been going on. This upstart uh, worship leader of the angelic host there who used to fly over Satan, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. His name, Lucifer. He wanted to be God. And God said, I don't think so, not in my lifetime. And they had a little battle and God kicked him out of heaven with one third of the angels. He realized he couldn't destroy God, so he thought he'd come and mess with some of God's property. Those made in the image of God. And he came to this earth and he tempted Adam and Eve and deceived them. And they partook of the forbidden fruit. And thus, here we are today. Sin and death entered into this world. Through his deception and through Adam's decision. And now we are infected and affected by that invisible virus called sin. And we face the consequences of that called death. And it's a reality that's all around us. But Jesus came to defeat our enemy. It was his enemy. And because we're on his side, he's our enemy. And Jesus came to defeat him. Now, when he defeated him, he didn't destroy him yet. We know that because he's still at work. He knows his time is limited. And he knows one day he's going to get his chance to reign and rule over his turf here on earth which he now, for a period of time, has control of. He is the spirit in the, of darkness that's in the power of the air, Ephesians chapter 2. He's the one who is the sons of, over the sons of disobedience, who act just like him and rebel just like him. He's the one who is over this world system. And he's bringing it all to a point where, you know, he'll have all of mankind worship him because that's what he wanted. That's what he's... And the ground right now is ripe for his arrival. But I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the return of Christ. And as I see that day approaching, I'm supposed to gather with my brothers and sisters and encourage them, stay faithful and stay true. Don't live in fear. Know that we have the one who has conquered the enemy. We need not fear him. 
And so I speak today to remind you that he has defeated the enemy. Inasmuch as the children have taken on flesh or been partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared in the same. He put this stuff on and he came. Why? That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, the devil thought if he could crucify the Son of God, he was going to win. And he didn't understand. It's just like C.S. Lewis put there in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The witch thought she could defeat Aslan, right? By having him die. But she didn't realize what happened, did she? If you've read the book or seen the movie. The devil thought that he won that day when he crucified the Son of God. And yet that was all part of the plan. That when his heel was bitten there at the cross by the snake, actually, he was going to crush the serpent's head. And now the Spirit of God that dwells within you and me enables us to not live in fear of the serpent, but to crush his head. Romans chapter 16, go read it sometime. That same Spirit now dwells within us, and we're supposed to be living in victory, but I'm telling you, that enemy is rearing his ugly head. And he's, he's causing a lot of people to live in fear. Why? Because he likes that. That's how he controls. Fear. Beloved, we live by faith, not by fear. Our God has conquered the enemy, Satan. We no longer have to fear him. Do you realize today that Jesus is on his throne and no one is removing him from it? He will get off of it once to come. Read the book of Revelation. He will come and he'll be riding on a charger. And he's coming and with one word he's going to defeat Satan and his armies. And he's going to throw him in the pit of hell that he designed for him. And until that day... We're supposed to live believing that our conqueror has defeated the enemy, Satan. Is that how you see the church living today? Is that how we're living? No. It's sad. It should cause alarm in our hearts. But realize today, Jesus has won the victory. We've sung about it and we've celebrated it. Now we've got to go live it, even in the face of death. You see, because he hasn't just conquered and defeated our enemy, Satan. Yes, he's, 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 he's Satan still rules right now. The picture, the idea is, is he's not conquered, but that he's, he's taken his power from him. He's rendered his power null and void. Why? Because he's defeated him with his key weapon, death. Death, the fear of death. And it was through his death on the cross that he defeated him. But he's not just the conqueror. He's also the liberator who delivers us from death. You see, look at verse 15. This is the second reason he highlights right here. Why we celebrate Jesus taking on flesh. He also came to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see... You and I, because we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We have no hope apart from Christ. That's how we live. And the devil puts us in bondage in that way, keeping us in the chains of bondage as we're sinners and we're not set free. And yet Jesus, it says here, he came to liberate us from that. He took on that flesh. Now watch this. You see, Jesus is fully God. He's the great I am. Deity cannot die. He took on flesh, and in his humanity, the humanity died for you and for me, taking the full wrath of God for us, paying the penalty that we deserved. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to pay the penalty. Well, Jesus released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime in subject to bondage. We deserved the wrath of God. Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2. 
we were children of wrath. We deserved it. We lived in fear because of it. People live in fear because of the bondage of sin and the bondage of death. You see it all around you right now. People don't realize who the shepherd is that is shepherding them. Either as we learned a couple weeks ago in Psalm 23 and Psalm 49, either you've got the shepherd who's the resurrection and the life, or death is shepherding you to the grave. And you'll get there unless you repent and put your faith and trust in Christ. Jesus came to deliver us and to liberate us from this bondage that we were enchained to. When he died on the cross, he loosed the chains for all who would repent and place their faith and trust in his sacrifice. All those who would say, wash me in your blood. I can't cleanse myself. I can't make myself acceptable to you. But I put my trust in your sacrifice that you offered in my place. And in that moment, he defeated Satan and he defeated death. You see, death is the last enemy, and Jesus destroyed it. We never have to fear Satan, sin, or the grave. When I gather with families and minister to them as they've lost loved ones, and we stand there at the graveside, we read, I typically read those verses from 1 Corinthians 15, the verses that we read earlier, that ask this question, there Paul highlights our victory in Jesus. Death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? It's gone. Why? Because God has given us victory through Jesus Christ, and he's given us freedom. Now, what's fascinating to me is the concepts of freedom and fear that are woven together here in Scripture. Man, I, I believe our founding fathers truly had a, a God-fearing perspective of life. Even old Ben Franklin, who said, you can't have freedom and have security. If you want security, you're going to give up your freedoms. And then you'll have neither. And that's where we're walking right into as Americans. Which is a shame. Because we realize that our Creator has given us certain rights. To life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm telling you, that's not how we're living. But that's how we were made to live. That's what God intended and what our founding fathers realized. You see, Jesus came and he frees us from the enemy. He conquers him, crushes his head. He liberates us from the bondage that the devil uses in people's life through sin and death. Paul says, listen, if we've realized this truth, to live is Christ and to die is gain what's happened why are we afraid what is there to be afraid of church death is the doorway it is the best thing that can happen for you and me in this life because we pass from this life into his presence forever and ever that's what we sing about that's what we celebrate that's what we're looking forward to Y'all, can I just give you a news flash? You probably haven't gotten this one. Fox News or CNN. Hopefully you don't watch that junk. And this isn't fake news. News flash. We're all going to die. News flash. Typically with viruses, we all get it at some point. Now I understand we don't want to overload the hospitals and we do certain things. <clears throat> there should be a question. I've not seen all the hospitals in the world overloaded quite like Italy's. There should be some questions being asked about this and the numbers because they don't match up. If you want the statistics, come to my office. We'll have a cup of tea. You can sit six foot feet from me if you want to. I'll sit right beside you. I'm not scared uh, if you have it. And I'll be glad to share with you some statistics statistics that they're not telling you some maps that they're not showing you oh by the way these aren't just created they're their information no hacker had to hack it he just downloaded it right from their website but they conveniently don't tell it why because then they can't control the situation 
and they lose control in their eyes instead of just telling the people the truth. Now, I know this about this deceiver. I know this about this destroyer. You know what he likes to do? He likes to deceive and he likes to divide because then he runs rampant over people's lives. And that's what I see happening all over. Divide the people, divide the churches, divide them, don't let them get close enough. You know why? Because I'm telling you, there's power in the many. There's power when we gather together. There's power when you're shoulder to shoulder with someone, not six feet apart. There's power, you know what, we're standing against this together. Now we're all in this together, don't get me wrong. But the devil knows something about dividing and defeating and conquering people. And he also knows something about deception. Because he's been a liar from the beginning. And from the beginning he's been a destroyer, a murderer. And this is what I, as your shepherd, I'm warning you against. And I'm telling you, you better wake up and realize something else is going on. And we're not supposed to be the ones living in fear or living in darkness. Jesus came to set us free, to defeat the enemy and to liberate us from the bondage of the fear of death. Now, how does he do that? He does it, verse 17, because he is the high priest who comes and sympathizes with our weaknesses. And before he became the high priest, he first was the lamb that was sacrificed for our sin. Notice this. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, in order to what? To make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, in order for us to be like him and go into his presence, not to become gods or little demigods, but to have a divine nature that could have glorified bodies and last forever, to be partakers of the divine nature, he took on flesh. He added it to his deity. He made us in his image so he could fill that image and redeem us. That's what his plan was from the beginning. And he comes, and now because he did that and identifies with us, and because he went to that cross and took the full wrath of God and is the propitiation, he appeased the wrath of God. He satisfied the wrath of God, the wrath of God for our sins. And this is when he was in the garden, and he said, Father, if this cup can pass through me, let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You remember that? That cup was the wrath of God. And he drank every last drop for you and for me. That's why we don't fear death. That's why we don't fear hell. That's why we don't fear that. Why? Because my Savior took it all for me. He shed his blood and he died and he took it all for us. Now here's the amazing thing. Because of that, and him identifying with us, we now have one who intercedes for us. He's our high priest. He's the one we run to. By the way, right now, if you have anxiety, if you have fear, if you're worried, you can act, call and pray with the pastor, and I've done that with many. They've texted me, said, Pastor, can I just pray with you? And I will. But I want to remind you, I'm not your high priest. He is. And I will pray with you. And I will encourage you with the Word of God. And I will remind you who He is and what He's done. And I will remind you to look to Him and turn to Him. Because He's available, not just for one of us, but for all who will come to Him. Why? Because He loved the whole world and gave Himself for the whole world. And He took the wrath of God for the whole world. Men go to hell, listen, not because of their sins that they've committed, but because the sin of unbelief, they will not believe in Jesus. That's their penalty. And the Spirit of God is convicting them of that and convicting them of righteousness that they don't possess and the judgment of the devil that's already happened and is coming one day to be fully realized. We have one, listen, who understands our weaknesses. In fact, right now, I know some are watching on Facebook Live. You're taking proper precautions. And if I was in a high-risk group, perhaps I would do the same. Uh, the evidence of this virus is that if you're over a certain age or in certain categories, it's a little rougher on you. Well, you know what? A prudent, wise man would take those precautions. That's wise, okay? 
I'm not denying that. What I realize is this, though. Sometimes people live in fear, and they're worried, and they're not in those categories. Jesus took on this flesh, and he knows what it means to walk in it like you're walking in it. And that's why you need to run to him because he can sympathize with you. He can empathize with you. He put this stuff on. That's why I run to him. That's why you run to him. That's why I encourage others. Run to him. Run to Jesus and look to him. Because he's near and not far to all who call on him. And see, because he put this stuff on, he knows how to navigate life. Why wouldn't we run to him? Why wouldn't we ask him for help? Now, this is what he does. Because he identifies with us, he's now our high priest, the one who intercedes for us, the one who has covered us with his blood because he offered himself as a sacrificial lamb for you and for me. He makes us acceptable to the Father, and we have instant access to the Almighty God who holds his creation in his hand and holds us in his hand. And we can run to him. And here's what he offers. Verse 16 and verse 18. He offers aid to us today. He's the one who aids us when in our weaknesses, in the trials, in the temptations, when we're tempted to give in, when we're tempted to live in fear, when we're tempted to put those chains back on that have been, we've been free from, he's there to offer aid. You know why? Because he's walked in this stuff called flesh. He knows what it's like. He knows when we're anxious. He understands that. And yet when you and I wear this flesh and bear this flesh, we don't always get it right. Praise God he did. Praise God he did. Look at twice in verse 16 and verse 18. Indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Praise the Lord. Who are the seed of Abraham? Those who have faith like Abraham. Those who are justified by faith like Abraham. Romans, Paul makes that argument. Those who realize, I can't make myself acceptable to God, but I by faith put my trust in what Christ has done, and I rest in his sacrifice, and that it's enough. God gives aid to such individuals. Verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. In other words, we have one that can take hold of us, snatch us, pull us to safety, push us there to safety. It's kind of like, listen, you know when you go to the pool, like the big pool, and everybody's swimming in the deep, and then there's that little, that little one who thinks they can swim, and they go and they run and they jump into the deep end. And you say, oh no. And then someone dives in or another child will dive in and what do they do? They push that one towards the wall, right? They give them aid. They push them so they don't drown. Jesus dove into humanity for us. Woo he dove in, listen, because we were sinking deep in sin. We had no hope. Far from the shore. He pushed us. He said, let me let me take care of this for you. You go to safety. I'll take all this for you and for me. He's able to identify with us and give us aid because he's taken our place. Praise the Lord. Now, why won't we run to him? Do we realize he has conquered sin, Satan, and death? Are we living like that? today. If ever there's a time in the history of the church when we should be living victoriously, it's always at Easter, but it should be every day. And if there's ever a time for you and I as the authentic children of God to shine brightly to a dark world around us and to give them hope in the fear of the shadow of death, it's to show that we're not afraid. And I don't have to fear death because my Savior has conquered it. And church, we need to live like that today. The fear I have is that our ears are open 
to everything the media is saying and not to what the Word of God says. In photography, they have this thing called forced perspective. You've done it with your cameras sometimes, uh, where you take your, your fingers like this and you take a picture with maybe a building in the background and it's like, look at how big my hands are. I can squeeze this building or squeeze an individual. Uh, we've done it on our trips to Romania where we'll have the missions team way back in the back and I'll stand up closer to the camera with my hand like this and it'll appear that everybody's just like little ones standing on my hand. It's called forced perspective. That's what the media is doing right now to people. They're forcing their perspective on 2%. Death, 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 death. Death, 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 death. And this virus. And what happens is that causes hysteria and people live in fear. And that's what's happening today. I'll be glad to have, sit down and talk with you more in my office if you'd like to more, know more details. I may even have a service on a Sunday night and let you come and ask any question you want. If you really want to know. Why? Because I'm your shepherd. And I'm supposed to warn you. And I'm supposed to protect you. And I'm supposed to tell you what the deceiver doesn't want you to know. And I'm supposed to tell you to not fear. And I'm supposed to tell you our Savior's already won the battle. And I'm supposed to remind you, don't live in fear because he's already crushed that serpent's head. And I'm here to tell you today, church, go live like it. Live by faith. You say, Pastor Chris, I'm having a hard time. Turn off the media. Go into the closet and have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him, help my unbelief. Help me. The church has got to rise out of this doldrums right now and wake up and realize we're not afraid. What can they do to us? What can anything do to us? Nothing. Let's live like it. Let's believe it. And let's show a world why they should believe like we do. Because right now, we've become like them. God help us. Isn't that what we just learned? He does. He gives aid to those who call on Him. Let me invite you to do that right now. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Ask the Lord this morning to renew our understanding, renew our minds with truth. Truth that we have believed. Truth that is proclaimed in His Word. Remember, it's in Hebrews that it says the Word of God is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. This Word is alive. It speaks to today, to our lives. Let's believe it. Ask the Lord to help us to do that today. If you don't know that Jesus is the one who has conquered sin and death for you, then we invite you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To cry out to Him and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve death. I can't save myself. But I believe Jesus died in my place. And I want to put my faith and my trust in Him. And the Bible says if you will repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you shall be saved. And you will be made righteous. And